Time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time. It's time for a good old fashioned Q and A, MMA fans. Ah, uh, last night was like a movie. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived. You guys to know hear that from the man himself, yeah. Ariel you heard Helwani. That? Live from the Mock da, Studios da, da, in beautiful da, da, da. Someone, New York um, City. Someone DM'd me at eight this morning nose. asking if they were and now, having a show to today. Answer your questions. Uh, yeah. Get out of your seats. You know what's amazing? Your feet because <clears throat> here he is, Ariel Helwani. Thank you very much to Mike Heck. I think if you look at my contract for this show, it says two-hour show. Um, so on average, we go four hours. I mean, we're way over the allotted. You know, it's it's almost like we've spoiled the 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 public, which I'm okay with. But you know, days like are Pavlov's dog. Yeah, days Every off for days Wednesday. off. You know, this this is what happens. Uh, and maybe we'll go. You know, weekly. Maybe 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 we'll go five days a week one day. You know. It's always been part of the dream. Could you imagine five days a week? What if one day we do Mondays our MMA talk, Tuesdays our boxing talk? Or what if we do this, Frank? Mondays MMA hour, Tuesday boxing hour, Wednesdays wrestling hour. You see what I'm saying? It would I see WW. Darts mm, No, Thursday maybe basketball hour and Friday's a bit of miscellaneous, you know, a little darts talk, a little soccer talk, a little news, a little notes, you know, could be something, something to chew on. Let the man cook. <laughs> that would be, you know, maybe, maybe that's what it's called, cooking with Hawani, but the different kind of cooking. Um, trying to find my questions here from one moderator, Lewis, who tells me he's been working so hard on this. He's always so thoughtful when it comes to curating the question. He tells me today's questions are very, very good. And so I'm looking forward to answering said questions. Let's get into it, my friends. Uh, first one is from Craig, who says, I know it's not something you like to speak about, but it's kind of the elephant in the room. Is Conor McGregor spiraling out of control? Irrespective of the truth around the latest allegations, do you think he's showing any indication that his competitive career can be saved? So that's one of the things that happened since we last spoke. Uh, there, there was an accusation of uh, rape towards Conor McGregor. I can get the um, the actual verbiage up here from that basketball game in which he was accused. What happened here? Why, why didn't this work? In which he was accused of hurting the, um, the, the heat mascot, Bernie. Let me pull this up. This just proves that I don't uh, read the questions beforehand. I like to have them fresh. You know what I'm saying? Of course. Uh, uh, damn, there's a lot of Conor McGregor articles. I'm trying to find the actual like original. Wow, there's a lot of Conor. What in the world? Uh, here's one from I just found CNN. A woman alleges she was sexually sexually assaulted by UFC fighter Conor McGregor after. Game four of the NBA Finals on June 9th in Miami, according to demand letters written by her attorney. McGregor has denied the allegations. Uh, the allegations are false. Mr. McGregor will not be intimidated. And so then it goes into it. And by now, you know most of the details. And so the question here is about him spiraling out of control. Ultimately, you know, that's the question he has to answer. The concerning part about this particular instance is, all right, you're watching the game. He's at the game. And it's it's great. He's there among the other celebrities and he's getting shine. And then it seems like he has this sponsorship deal with Tidal and the Miami Heat. And it's it's great. You know, like he's a mainstream A-list celebrity. And then two things happen as a result of being at the game. That's a problem, right? That is a problem. And I think anyone around him would recognize that. Like, you know, we can't go to a game and have two things happen. And I, I, we don't even know what's the result of the um, the whole mascot thing. Did the guy seriously get hurt? Is he pressing charges? Like that just kind of fizzled out, but it could be a thing that could uh, actually lead to, you know, some, some legal issues for him. Who knows? And so that is a problem. And there's obviously been some other things in the past. And uh, the, the unfortunate part about all of this is that if Conor McGregor never wants to fight again, not only is he set for life, his children are set for life, and their children are set for life. That's how successful his proper 12 has been. 
one suspects his forged stout will be. He's got this title thing. And not to mention the money that he's made as a fighter and any type of money that he can make as, you know, a front man, an owner, an investor, et cetera, et cetera. Three children has a fourth on the way. Congratulations. He announced that last week. He's in New York now. And uh, you, ju- you just kind of want him to enjoy the fruits of his labor and stay out of trouble. Whether it's true, not true, like if you're surrounded by these things, as opposed to just going to a game and going home, that's the troubling part. And then if it's actually true, that's even more troubling. Um, his team vehemently denies this. They've sent out multiple statements. But you just want to be, you know, free from all of this and not be associated with any of it. So, you know, in addition to all of that, there are questions about his fighting future and the USADA stuff. And that's been an ongoing piece of drama. And who knows when he's coming back, if he's coming back. They haven't announced the fight. Um, I see I see right in front of me here, there's a question about Michael Chandler. So I'll save the Chandler portion for the second question. But yeah, I mean, none of this is good. No one wants to be associated with any of this stuff. Um, and it feels like there was a point 2017, 2018, where he could do no wrong, right? Where where he was just on fire and was such a role model and an inspiration. And I was, trust me, I was just in Ireland. He is still that guy to a lot of people and he could still become that guy once again. Uh, but this stuff, this stuff doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. It, it only hurts, excuse me. It doesn't help, it only hurts. Um, guilty, not guilty, you just don't want to be associated with any of this. Um, and it feels like four years ago can do no uh, wrong. Now it's like you go to a basketball game and there's two things that happen as a result, that can happen. So the best thing I think would be if he can get that fire back. Like you watch the documentary and you see him with his kids and you see him with the training and you're like, all right, this is the guy that everyone fell in love with. If he could get that back, is it possible to get that back with the fame, with the fortune? He's the best one to answer that question. Um, I see that he's back training with our old friend Dylan. Maybe that's the missing ingredient. Uh, maybe he's back to training and 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 staying on the straight and narrow. We can't pretend that Conor McGregor is the only super duper famous athlete that has ever dealt with something like this. He may be the first that has dealt with something like this on this stage in MMA, but this is a you know this is a common story in boxing. And in other sports, a ton of high-level athletes have dealt with these issues, demons, distractions, whatever you want to call them. Some are able to overcome, some aren't. And I I don't think he is at the point where he can't overcome. I don't think he's at the point where he has done, you know, irreparable harm to his legacy or reputation, but none of this helps. And, you know, for his sake, he doesn't want to get to the point where it is irreparable. So let's see. Uh, I do think he fights again. I don't know if it's this year. It seems like the, you know, I I ultimately am not going to hang my hat on the six-month thing because USADA changes the rules and the goalposts and who the hell knows, and they don't really address any of this stuff. Much like with the officiating and my frustration with all that, it feels like we're all just guessing. Um, they, They change laws and rules without telling us, and we're going off of old things, so who the hell knows? They could come out and be like, oh, yeah, he's good. He uh, he signed up. We just forgot to update the website. Who the fuck knows? Uh, but I do think he fights again. Who that guy is, what he looks like, how he fights remains to be seen. But uh, I would love nothing more than to see, you know, the fresh-faced, uh, just on fire, good vibes, good, you know, good role model that we saw back in 16, 17, 15, 14, uh, because there was nothing like that. And, and, and maybe we're all fooling ourselves thinking that that guy could come back, but I still think he's young and I still feel like, you know, if he is able to get his, uh, you know, his distractions out of the way and focus and just be content with what he has and has so much to be thankful for that he could do that. But none of this is good right now. And, uh, this isn't the type of stuff you don't want to, you don't want to go to a basketball game and then be worried about, you know, things happening to like you 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 just want to be a normal celebrity go to the basketball game go home go on this trip go home go to can go home uh, and and not always have these things pop up so that is that is worrying and and you'd like to think that he has people around him who are helping him and who are trying to shield him from getting into any type of predicament or trouble so uh, i do think he fights again remains to be seen 
what happens when he fights and when he'll be able to fight. Now, the second question is associated to this. Hutt says, Ariel, what would you do if you were Michael Chandler? Continue to wait, impossible, waste your time, take another fight, be the backup fighter for the BMF. Thoughts, love the show, you are all great. And Ariel's best friend says, hello, Ariel, how long until we can start saying that Michael Chandler is squatting on a spot? Here's the thing, he's nowhere near the squatting on the spot um, territory because we're still in the midst of the ultimate fighter and there's only been four weeks of it that has aired. So until that show is done, he's not squatting on any spot. And he would be foolish. You know, I loved what Armin Sarukian said. And shout out to him. He had a great win on Saturday. And that's the type of thing that he should do. Like, yo, Michael Chandler, your fight ain't happening. Come fight me. Chandler would be foolish if he takes that fight now. Because we're only four weeks into the Ultimate Fighter. Might as, well, might as well wait and see how this plays out because, let's be honest, that's his biggest payday by far. That's his biggest fight ever by far. Uh, I do feel bad for Chandler because I feel like he's the one out there doing a post show, doing this on social media, and now as the weeks go by, you can see the frustration building and you can see like the, I don't want to say embarrassment, but like he, like he kind of feels like he's a little bit like that bride at the altar just kind of waiting for the groom to show up. Um, and, and, and you see the comments and people are like, bro, the fight ain't happening. You need to move on. Now, I think we should chill a little bit. Only four weeks in, there's a precedent of the fight not happening right after the ultimate fighter. Remember Rampage and Rashad way back in the day, they did not fight in, uh, in December. They ended up fighting in May. So five months after this could be a very similar thing. So we'll see. Um, it's not ideal. I would like to think that they weren't planning on this, but you know, ESPN got what they wanted. They got Connor on the show for whatever it is, 14 weeks, 15 weeks. Um, UFC got what they wanted. They get all this content, but you know, you want the payoff and it would be weird if they don't actually fight. If I were advising Michael Chandler, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't move on just yet. Now, if we get to freaking September, October, and there's no end in sight, yeah, then I would consider moving on. Take a fight and then revisit. Uh, but we're nowhere near that point. It's it's only June 21st. We're only four weeks into the show. Uh, but you could definitely, I mean, I saw that video of him yesterday with the USADA, and he's like, where are you at? Like, you can, you can feel the frustration. You know what I would say to Michael Chandler? I would say maybe do less. You disappear as well so that you're not putting yourself out there and, and, and that frustration isn't becoming apparent. Um because you could tell, like, he, 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 he thought he had it, and now it feels like it's all up in the air. And it's not just the USADA stuff. Who knows if any of this other stuff that has just come out will, you know, delay his return even further. Who knows? Um, I would suggest doing less. Maybe chill on the post shows. Maybe chill on the, the media. Maybe chill on the social media. Um, because it's only, you know, it's only putting him out there more and, and, and leading to more people mocking or whatever. So I feel for him. And uh, I don't think he should move on just yet. Still think he has a couple months to wait. But you can see, like, it's building, it's building. And as every week goes by and there's more uncertainty and mystery surrounding all of this, I can see the uh, the pressure for him to move on mounting and, and other fighters are going to come out and be like, yo, let's move on. And isn't it crazy? He gets the ultimate fighter opportunity before Dustin Poirier, who beat him in November... And then Dustin's the one on the outside looking in. And now Dustin's fighting for the BMF title on, on July 29th, and he's going to return before Chandler. And who knows if he has a great performance there, maybe he becomes the next in line. It's just crazy, this seesaw between them, where it seemed like Dustin was getting kind of, you know, he was getting the shaft, and now he's back in, in pole position. Weird game. It's a very weird game. And plus, Dustin, you know, is on the verge of winning the most prestigious title in the game. Two months ago, he's on the outside looking in. Craziness. Um, number three, P to the G. Level of excitement for Cejudo versus Cheeto and UFC 292, which is shaping up to be the battle of the bantamweights. And do you think it's the right matchup for both men at this stage? All the best to you and the crew. You know yourself. I mean, I'm fascinated by it. Ton of respect for Cheeto coming off you know, one of the toughest losses of his career, maybe the fight that was going to get him a title shot, if not a really big fight, and, you know, it didn't go his way, and now he's coming back, 
against Henry Cejudo, the two-division former champ, Olympic gold medalist, who may in fact be a tougher opponent than his last opponent as far as like style-wise for him. That's a big freaking fight. And there's a lot of pressure. And I have a lot of respect for him not saying like, hey, let me take a step back and fight someone who's in, you know, the 15 to 10 range. He's fighting a guy who, you know, was a round away from winning the title last month in Newark. Um, so I, I get it from a Cejudo standpoint. Marab isn't available and Corey just got booked against Umar for August 5th in Nashville. He's the biggest name out there. And so we'll talk to Cheeto about this fight and, and you know, the thought process behind taking it. But uh, yeah, I mean, UFC, what is it? Two, is it 292? UFC 292? Yeah, there it is. Uh, shaping up to be a nice one. Where's my... Uh, I always feel like Tapology has the best, most up-to-date. Sterling O'Malley, Zhang Wei Li, Amanda Lemos, Rob Font, Song Yadong. That's the second bantamweight fight. Jeff Neal, Ian Machado Gary, Cejudo Marlin, another bantamweight fight. Cody Garbrandt, Mario Bautista, another bantamweight fight. Gerald Mearshart, Andre Petrosky. Chris Weidman, Brad Tavares, Gregory Rodriguez, uh, Dennis Chilun, Marina Moroz, Karin Silva, Andrea Lee, Natalia Silva. It's not bad. It's not bad. And especially with three pay-per-views in the span of almost a month. Not bad at all. Uh, Robert, Ariel. So yesterday, Cejudo versus Cheeto was announced. It was more reported, but uh, I guess you could say it was announced because it came from Dana White. Then shortly thereafter, it was said that Cejudo has a shoulder injury and the fight is in a done deal. Let's say I was a huge Cejudo or Cheeto fan and my willingness to buy tickets to the event was based on that and not the other participants on the card. If I'm not mistaken, if the main event is altered, that is when fans have an opportunity for refunds or recourse. But if a misleading announcement is made for a fight that as fans buying tickets to watch a people's main event or otherwise, that is problematic. What do you think about this practice? And is it fair to the ticket buying fans? I mean, ultimately like the UFC's hands are somewhat clean here because they didn't announce it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's why it always says card subject to change. There's really nothing that they can do. It's, it's always a main event thing. Um, and it's a slippery slope. If you like, if you anoint one fight on the card as the fight that you can get a refund if it falls through, like that's just, that's just impossible. It's just, you know, it's just a risk that comes with buying tickets to these events. Unfortunately. Um, the bigger question is if in fact, Henry didn't agree to the fight and I can't imagine, look, we've seen situations like Aljamain Sterling and Sean O'Malley where they announce a fight and one guy didn't agree to it. Uh, I will say one of the fights that was announced, not this one last week, I reached out to the team. I was like, wow, a uh, great fight. And they're like, yeah, we don't have anything in front of us. We don't have a bout agreement. Now there were some, you know, some, some, some theories thrown out there that they made these, uh, these announcements on Thursday to drown out, you know, the Connor news that came out on Thursday afternoon. Who knows? They certainly did that when uh, the Francis news broke. I don't know if they did that for the Connor one, but this is PR 101. It's the oldest trick in the book uh, to try to like, you know, move something down the, the, the ladder and in terms of the news items of the day and you just get people excited and, 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 and distracted and, and you kind of just say like, oh, look at this shiny toy when something else that you don't want getting a lot of attention uh, is getting attention. So the bigger issue and the issue that I've always had, and this was the issue that came up when I was at ESPN, is that they would rush to make these announcements before everyone, um, you know, agreed to it. Now, I would say that the UFC has their motive for doing this. Sometimes they want, or any promotion, really, it's not just the UFC, but sometimes the promotion will do it because they want to try to put public pressure on the fighter. Either they're giving them a hard time or, you know, they're not really quick to agree and they'll put it out there. And then if the fight falls through, they could be like, yo, we had this fight. It's on them, not on us. Um, sometimes they're quick to give a, a favorite media member a scoop and then it's on them. It's on the media member. Like it's, it's the worst look possible. Like just because the UFC and Dana White gives you something, you still have to, to check. I remember one time, you know, and I'm not going to pretend like I've never been on the other end of those phone calls, but one time actually it was for, I think UFC 169. I 
think it was uh, Cruz Faber. One time, Dana White gave me a scoop and I called the particulars and one of them told me that they hadn't agreed to it. And then I went back to him and, you know, he got mad. He's like, I gave it to you not to, but I'm like, how can I, you know, what are, what are you talking about? Like, how can I not check? Uh, you can't just go off of one person. Uh, there's, there's really three people that you have to check with the promotion fighter, a fighter B. And so if a journalist is putting something out there and not checking and just going off of one person, whether it's fighter a fighter B or the promotion and the promotion, I would say is the one that you have to be the most careful with because you know, sometimes they have their own ulterior motives, then that's a problem. So I don't really know what to tell you, Robert, but this has been happening all the time. And it was a thing that was happening a lot when I was at ESPN in short, because uh, they didn't want me to, to break it. And so they were rushing to get it out there before everyone had agreed to it. As you may have noticed, you know, I've, I've sort of stepped back a little bit from that game because I, I find really no enjoyment and, because they put the fear of God in the managers and the fighters. Um, it's just like, yeah, okay, you can you can have the tweet. You can put it out there, and I'd love to have you on the show to talk about it. I get more enjoyment out of that. It's really not fun. Um, but still batting 1,000, baby. Woo! Still batting 1,000. Uh, Cole, Ariel, I would love to hear your opinions on Rob Wilkinson regarding his cheating scandal as well as other PFL fighters. My question spotlights specifically Rob. Should he have to give up some sort of percentage of his one million tournament win for popping just months after? Thanks for all the content. Love the show. It's not a bad shout, Cole. PFL had a bit of a mess on their hands, and uh, I'm told they're going to use USADA for the um, uh, the playoffs that are coming up. Man, what is it like? Eleven fighters or something like that? That's crazy. Should he have to? I mean, here's the thing. He didn't pop, or did he pop? Did he pop after the the win, or did he pop? Like, you know, did he pop? Did he pop after a test, like directly after the win, or was it months, months later? Because if it's months later, it's impossible to prove when he did it. And yeah, he did. It was from it was from April, so I I don't think he could give out. I don't think that's fair. It was in New York. He didn't pop as a result of that victory, so you can't go retroactive. One thing that I don't think comes up here, because I'm looking at them, I see a Francis PFL question. This PFL Bellator story is a huge one and a very fascinating one. And uh, a few weeks ago on the show, I think I was asked about it. And he, and here's the absolute truth. Now, there's going to be uh, some some people online that are, you know, this is what happens also with online uh, scoops, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Like you hear something that has a 50% chance of coming um, to fruition and you'll attach yourself to it. And there's a very good chance that it happens. And there's a very good chance that it doesn't happen. And no one really remembers when it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, you take a victory tour for fucking six months asking everyone to pat you on the back. I get it. It's it's good. You get some some pub. We've all been there. But the truth of the matter is this. As I said and, and I don't know if I was the first, I don't care who the hell cares, but definitely late last year, because I remember getting phone calls afterwards, Bellator uh, has been on the, uh, the market for a while. I think that was the term that I used. Now, there was some talk that they would just look for an investor. My understanding is they are looking to be sold. And, you know, I have heard of multiple players that have been interested in, uh, in purchasing them. Um, and I know that PFL was uh, one of those players that looked into them, but for various reasons, price tag, what they were, whatever, uh, PFL backed out. Now I can also tell you, just to show that you know we know what's up, uh, Liberty Media was one that has looked into them. I can also tell you that the Khan family has looked into them. Uh, to what degree is unclear. And when I'm talking about the Khan family, I'm talking about Shad Khan and his son, Tony Khan, who of course owned the Jacksonville Jaguars, Fulham and All Elite Wrestling. Uh, that would be a wild one, right? Imagine they own uh, Bellator and AW while Endeavor owns WWE and uh, UFC. That would be wild stuff. But I can also say that as of a couple weeks ago, 
uh, PFL got back into the mix and have great interest. And they do have some new investment coming up. And I think some of that is going to come out in the next few weeks or months. Stay tuned for that. And so I think that there's a big push now to create this behemoth number two. And so we'll see if they can get it done. So last week when Scott Coker said PFL was one of the players, that is true. They're not the only player, but they're definitely one of the players that are interested in buying Bellator. And I do believe that um, that that they are looking to sell, that Viacom is looking to sell Bellator uh, by the end of this year. Like that is, that is sort of the plan and the hope. Um, so we'll see what happens. And I think that that's part of the reason why, like last week's event, the Sergio Pettis event, and uh, Pitbull and Yoel Romero and Vadim Nemkov, congrats to Vadim on the win, isn't getting the promotional and, and marketing muscle that maybe some of the uh, the other events on Showtime on boxing, you know, with boxing are getting because uh, I think they've kind of reached the end of the road, is my understanding and feeling. Um, and so we'll see. If PFL absorbs, buys Bellator, are they a legit threat? I don't think the UFC is losing sleep. Uh, is the roster much better? Yes, because I would say that Bellator's champions are better than PFL's champions. Um, does it make things super interesting if you have Patricio Pipple and AJ McKee and uh, Johnny Eblen and Yaroslav Amasov and Gegard Mousasi and Fabian Edwards and uh, Patricky Pipple and all these dudes under you know one umbrella with the likes of OAM and Larissa Pacheco and We'll see about Kayla Harrison's future in Chamber. Yes, um, it's interesting. I, I I feel like overall the Bellator roster is better than the PFL roster, but it's the PFL structure and momentum, and they had great ratings last week that is making them feel like the bigger player. And of course, Francis Ngannou, who they recently signed but together, it's a solid number two. Um, and let's see, you know, what they could do together. But there's also a chance that you know they go to someone else. Um, so it's a very interesting story to follow, and it's one that has gotten a lot more interesting over the last couple weeks. Uh, no one really asked me about that, but I saw PFL and I wanted to talk about that because, like I said, a lot has happened since we last spoke. We could talk more about that later on as well. Uh, Ali Me, hey, Ariel, with Francis and Jones squaring up at PFL, is this a sign that the UFC is testing the waters to see how big of a fight they can make? Uh, it seems that there's a real appetite for this fight, as we all know, but I'm scratching my head about how UFC could just let their biggest star, Jones, walk around in a PFL shirt and promote their business, especially after Dana's recent comments. Thanks, Parlay Pals is best, or is better, he says. Thank you for that. Um, no, uh, John Jones was there to corner uh, his teammate, Maurice Green, and uh, there they are. John Jones and Francis Agato would have seen this was on Friday in Atlanta. Uh, fun stuff. You know what it felt like to me? <clears throat> it felt like boxing to me. These two dudes were under the same umbrella. The UFC could have made this fight. It seemed like three years ago, both of them wanted to make this fight. They couldn't make it happen. Shout out to Ray Seffo in the middle there, getting that uh, getting that shine, smart on his part. Uh, but this was great stuff. This was great theater, but it was one big tease because now, you know, they're not under the same umbrella. Here's the most amazing part about this scene and the reaction to this scene in its aftermath. The most amazing part about it is there is nothing. There is no law. There is no bylaw. There is no rule. There is no roadblock that is actually stopping this fight from being made now, even with Francis Ngannou in the PFL. Why? Because there is nothing that states that two promoters can't come together to promote an event. Bellator does it with Ryzen, et cetera, et cetera. And I would go as far as to say that in the history of potential super fights, co-promotions, this could actually be the easiest one to get done. Why? Because historically, the UFC has always been on networks that were exclusive to the UFC. Spike TV, Fox, now ESPN. But guess what? ESPN also has another promotion under their umbrella, and that's the PFL. And so ESPN could sit down and say, look, guys, we want to make this happen. The same way we 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 saw that you guys made McGregor Mayweather happen with your arch rivals, Showtime, let's make this happen. We could sell this on pay-per-view. We could all take a cut. You guys could take 70%. You guys could take 30%. Whatever it is, it's never been easier for the UFC to co-promote with another promotion as it is right now with PFL. Now, of course, they're not going to want to do it. 
but look at the appetite, look at the interest, and you can arguably say that there is no more interesting and bigger fight for both guys than that one. And yet it's not going to happen because I don't think ESPN will force the UFC to do it, and I don't think the UFC cares to do it, wants to do it. Also, the amazing thing about this Tyson Fury thing, where Tyson Fury is now saying, I got an offer, like, why didn't you try to make that deal with Francis? Francis was openly saying, like, I want a box. Why didn't you at least try to make that deal? Why are you doing it now with Jones? The whole thing gives me one big headache. But again, the point is, they could make that fight happen. There's nothing stopping them from making that fight happen. John was there cornering. He's wearing the shirt. That's the uniform. And I think he was just having a little bit of fun. No different than Connor at BKFC squaring off with Mike Perry. Ultimately, I don't think they're going to get their panties in a bunch over something like that. If it keeps happening, maybe they'll get annoyed. But what are they going to say to John Jones or Conor McGregor? Now, if there's if they're talking a you know sixth rank dude, they might say like, "Yo, man, cool your jets." But also, sixth rank dude isn't getting that type of attention. Khabib has been at Bellator event. They're just you know what are you going to do? You can't tell the guy not to wear the shirt if he has to, you know if he's going to corner. He has to wear the shirt. So I don't think that there was anything more to that. I don't think the UFC sent him there to test the waters. But my big takeaway upon seeing that was like, this could happen. And it actually is easier than usual because of ESPN. Because it would be an ESPN plus pay-per-view. They would stand to gain from it too. This could easily happen. But it's not going to happen because that's just the way MMA is structured. Taco Enthusiast. Hi, Ariel. I'm really rooting for the PFL. I've gone to both events here in Atlanta, and it feels like they're really building something special right now. By the way, stop pronouncing the second T in Atlanta. We say Atlanta. Is that true, GC? Is it Atlanta? Because I say Toronto. Nah, yeah, I can confirm that. It's Atlanta? Atlanta. But you're not from Atlanta. Wow. Heavy on the second T there, Frank. Button. I say Atlanta. Is that wrong? No, you just sound... I sound foreign. Formal. Yeah, Atlanta. How do you say the place yeah. uh, up north, the six, where the Raptors play? Toronto. <laughs> you know you don't say it like that. That's funny. You probably say Toronto. No, nah, Toronto Raptors. That's crazy. What about yeah. the city in Louisiana? New Orleans? <laughs> New Orleans? No, that's just... Oh, now you're getting... I think we're it. just talking about T's here. Yeah. Um, all right, Atlanta. All right. Atlanta. Which is like weird if because... Really, if you really want to fit in, uh, just call it Hot Atlanta. Locals love that. Don't they hate that? No, they love I've it. I've gotten shit for that. There's a yeah. couple that I've... that I, I, I've called Dallas uh, Big D and people get mad at me for oh, that. Yeah, 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 Big D. Or The Big D and they get really mad about that. <laughs> um, Hot Atlanta? You guys... Are, what about... Yeah, yeah locals A-Town. love A-Town. A-Town is, is more acceptable, but I would still never say that. There's a great wrestler named uh, Austin Theory. He comes out to A-Town Down. He's from Atlanta. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yes, Austin Theory and I know the song, yeah. A-Town Down. Wait, is that a real song? Is it a custom song? Yeah. Or is it like Usher, Usher starts that one song, Peace Up, A-Town Down? Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Uh, wow. Uh, anyway, while the fight's spectacle and face-offs have been amazing, the slow pace of each event has been absolutely brutal. My girlfriend fell asleep before the Brendan Lochnane fight because there was nothing going on for like 40 minutes. Do you think this is a result of the production needing to be fine-tuned or the format improved? Or do you think this is all to ensure they get paid from their advertiser? It seems like such a simple thing to fix, but maybe there's something missing. I mean, ultimately, it's about TV time. If fights are ending very quickly, you know, we'd love for it to last 45 minutes, but they have a hole to fill, right? They have a slot to fill. And so I know that this has been a complaint. One thing that I would suggest... Why don't they try to, you know, the UFC used to do this a lot back in the day, like squeeze in a prelim or two, you know, cut it down, show us the third round, something. And instead, like, you know, there's no greater buzzkill, like let's go to the desk or let's go to this, let's go to that. You know, I I, I, I take a third round. Oh, this happened earlier tonight. We're going to show you uh, the third round of this prelim fight between Mr. X and Mr. Y. Why not? Scott F. Good day, Ariel. Here for the weekly AEW question. AEW. A-E-Dub. Oh, wait. Is uh, is my man here? No, he's not. All right. Uh, here for the weekly AEW question. Thoughts on CM Punk's return promo? Still trying to figure out if the heat with the elite and the other talent is still there or if Punk is just playing it up. You're the man. You know how you know it's legit? Because the best thing that they could have done was if he came out, which, by the way, the whole thing felt a lot like August of 2019. Like, we saw the big return, Chicago, all that, but that's fine. It, it was great to see him back. And I wish him the best. But you know how you know it's still legit and it's still fresh? It's because none of those guys interrupted the promo. 
Had they interrupted it and turned the shoot into a work, a storyline, now you know it's water under the bridge. But because they didn't, and maybe they changed their mind down the line, but for me, I was waiting to see if one of them would interrupt. Uh, because they didn't, it makes me think that it's still fresh and they're trying to keep them separate, which is a shame because that's the biggest money that they can make and the most interesting storyline slash few that they can do. Why wouldn't you try to capitalize on that? Um, you know, what is, uh, what does Vinnie Mac always said? He said, you know, whatever's best for business and what's best for business is that feud right there. Uh, remember when Matt Hardy and edge had their issue with Lita and then Matt came back and we all weren't sure if it was legit or not. And I mean, that was over a girl. What's more personal than that? This is just some feelings being heard about business and whatnot. Like if those dudes could have put it aside, I feel like these guys could put it aside. If one of them would have interrupted or some of them or all of them, then you would have known, you know, bygones be bygones, but they didn't. And so to me, it felt a tad underwhelming, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, Adriano, hello, Ariel. Hope you had a great Father's Day. If we could turn the MMA hour to the WWE Minute, minute, love to get your thoughts on the bloodline in this past week's segment. You see, now you're just setting me up. I, I criticized the AEW thing which, you know, God bless, but now I'm going to sit here and praise the WWE thing. You're just setting me up. I don't know who to blame here. Am I blaming Adriano? Am I blaming uh, moderator Lewis? Anyway, love to get your thoughts on the bloodline and this past week's segment. It's definitely one of the most compelling storylines we've had in professional wrestling since. I can't even remember. What is your interest level heading into Money in the Bank? Thank you, as always. It's like a movie. It's like the kids say. It's like a freaking movie. No, that was tremendous. Um... Usually when I'm about to go to one of these events, which I will be, I will be in London for Money in the Bank uh, next weekend, amazingly. I can't believe it's already here, July 1st. I start to ramp up my watching. And so I've ramped up my watching again because I'll be there covering it for BT Sport. And uh, it's been amazing. The twists and turns, the ups and downs. I still maintain Sami Zayn should have won in Montreal. Um, but this Civil War thing, which I think may lead to Jay against Roman and maybe Jay winning, who knows? Or maybe Logan Paul cashes in money in the bank. I mean, who knows? I would say my interest is pretty high. It's been fun. And the twists and turns have been great, but I think they need to stop with the twists and turns. Like, all right, the line has been drawn. It's it's Solo and Roman against those two guys, the Usos, and, and let's see how it plays out. And maybe Rikishi makes an appearance. But no, that was tremendous. Jay and Jimmy are legit stars, main eventers, and it's been very fun. And my favorite part about all this stuff is seeing Paul Heyman's reaction. Like his facial expressions are just absolutely tremendous. Dearest Ariel and the boys, what's the latest with the James Krause and gambling accusations story? Uh, you were saying it could be one of the biggest stories of the year and we're halfway through the year and haven't heard a thing. Yeah, haven't heard a thing. That is true. Remember we spoke to Jeff Molina. He said that he thought it was going to be wrapped up soon. Hasn't happened. Um, I know GC's... You know, he's he's got his finger on that pulse. Any any talks of this story anymore? It, it really has sort of fizzled out, hasn't it? Yeah, I haven't heard anything. I, Crazy, right? I was right? thinking about it the other day, and I was looking up uh, stuff on James Cross, and there hasn't been anything. I wonder what he's doing. Like, I wonder what he's up to. Yeah, because he's disappeared, right? Yeah, nothing from him. Is his Instagram and Twitter still gone? Uh, yeah, I mean, he hasn't posted anything crazy because he was really building up that instagram with the oh, videos yeah. and everything yeah the discord yeah i wonder Twitter where he is no I, I haven't heard anything i haven't even heard any rumblings any rumors any whispers nothing yeah i mean i think he's laying low for a reason then obviously you know fighters like derek menner and jeff molina yeah well menner for sure like molina i feel like is is missing out on some you know some valuable time here to fight 100 percent I don't know. I feel like it's just a waiting game until we find out more. All right. Here's uh, Stefan or Steven. Shalom, Ariel. First time, long time. Kayla Harrison's contract expires later this year. Will PFL really risk letting one of their biggest attractions walk away? Will she fight on the finals card? Any news insight on her situation? I think they're keeping her for the pay-per-view card that they're doing at some point. Uh, but I spoke to her recently, and I, I think she's getting a little frustrated. She would like to fight, but it doesn't look like she's going to be in the tournament, which means she can't be on any of these cards coming up. I'm sure they could just do a special attraction fight like they did with Clarissa Shields back in the day and others. But right now there's nothing really that I'm hearing. And that kind of sucks because the last impression of her was, uh, 
you know, the, 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 the loss to Larissa Pacheco. And that was in November. That was seven months ago. So I would like to see her back. But uh, right now I don't hear of uh, any fights in the work in the works. And uh, Chris Cyborg resigned with the uh, Bellator. And it looks like they're going to do Cyborg versus Zingano. What's a bigger fight? Cyborg Pacheco or Cyborg Kayla Harrison? Um, I don't know. Sounds like someone wants to weigh in there because I just heard the volume go up. Cyborg Kayla Harrison for sure. Yeah, okay. No doubt. Uh, but Pacheco's looking good though, right? Yeah, she just got like a 43-second knockout yeah. last Friday. Yeah. I mean, she's unbelievable, but, but from a name value standpoint, a hype standpoint, yeah. Kayla Harrison versus Cyborg. Uh, the rumor there too. Yeah, of course. And it's been going on for well over a year. Uh, rumor has it that your pal Brian Campbell is unavailable to cover the Spence Crawford fight week. Any chance we get a reunion with your old friend Luke Thomas? It wouldn't be the MMA beat brouhaha we'd all hope for. But I think I speak for all of us in saying I'd love to see this. Uh, no, no talks of that at the moment. Uh, there was some talk of maybe doing stuff at... Crawford Spence, but nothing just yet. So stay tuned. I didn't know that about Brian. So uh, I really enjoy working with Brian one on one. I've never done one on one with Luke. At least I, I mean, obviously that may be, but I just mean in this era, uh, would have no issues with it, but it has not been brought to my attention. Uh, finally, our good friend uh, Angela Higgins writes uh, Hi, Ariel and the team. She is the pride of Scotland, by the way. She uh, she just visited the studio, was it last week? I think it was last Monday. Yeah, it was last Monday. Not this past Monday, uh, last week. And it was great to have her here. A longtime supporter and fan of the program and of mine. Hope you're all well. Thanks for your hospitality last week. It was wonderful to meet you all. And it was great to meet you as well. I have uh, I have a bit of a life question, if I may. Okay, this is fun. On Monday, the 26th of June, I have an interview for a managerial position that will be a bit of a life changing, a bit be a bit life changing personally and financially for me. I know my stuff in relation to the job, but my confidence when being interviewed is not great. Any advice for someone who has more of the quiet confidence of a Leon rather than the supreme self belief of an Izzy? Thanks a lot and wish me luck. Well, I do wish you luck, and I think you're going to smash it. And even if you do have the quiet confidence of a Leon as opposed to the as you put it, supreme self-belief of an Izzy, that's okay because the key word there is confidence. So if you walk into that room with your shoulders back, chest out, mm, feeling good about yourself, then you'll be okay. It's the people who walk in looking down, unsure of themselves, unsure of their qualifications, whether or not they really belong, whether or not they really matter, you know, soft handshake, those are the ones that give off the impression that they don't belong. But, you know, there's an old saying, fake it till you make it. I don't think that you're faking it, but you got to go in there and, and, and act like you own the joint. Because guess what? What's the worst that happens? You don't get it. Well, you've got another opportunity and, and, and maybe it wasn't meant to be. So I say you go in there feeling your best, get a good night's sleep, Eat good food the day before. Be prepared. Do your research on the company, on the person that you're speaking to. People love that, by the way. If you drop a little nugget on uh, the person that you're speaking to, oh, yeah, I saw that in 2014 you did X, Y, and Z. People love that, um, that you you went the extra mile. Uh, you'll do fine. You just walk in there strong, confident, sure of yourself, and you'll smash it. Why wouldn't they want to hire you? If, if, if you walk in there with a self-deprecating attitude and you're kind of down and you're ho-hum and you're, you know, humble and all that, I'm not saying you go in there and you say like, I'm the shit, I'm the best, I'm the greatest of all time. But you could give off the impression that you belong, that they will be making a gigantic mistake if they don't hire you, that they will regret this until the end of time if they don't hire you. You can give off that vibe in a very classy and professional manner. You walk in there, oh, yeah, I've done a lot of research on your company. Let me tell you a thing or two. You be respectful. You be, uh, you know, you be complimentary, but also tell them how you can help. You'll, you'll be just fine. And also be passionate. Show that you want it. 
Don't act like you're too cool for school. Let them know that you want this. Let them know how much this means to you. Let them know how much you've been waiting for this, this chat, this opportunity. And uh, people love passion. You can't, you can't replicate that and you can't fake passion. Uh, it, has, uh, it has served me very well. If you truly want it, if you act like you want it, if you give off the impression that you want this, that you eat and sleep this and it's all you care about, uh, people are attracted to that. So uh, give off those vibes and uh, I'm sure you're going to do great. And I would like an update. And you know how to find me on uh, how this goes in uh, five days' time. Now, 